Good evening and welcome to E-Bible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 8 of Revelation chapter 4. And we're continuing to look at verse 6. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And once again, we want to correct that translation. There were four living creatures full of eyes before and behind. And uh, we, we have um, the Bible's uh, direction to make that correction based upon the Greek word that's used here and based upon the translation of living creatures in Ezekiel chapter 1. So here uh, in this glimpse into the glorious uh, throne room of the kingdom of heaven we see this sea of glass before the throne like unto crystal and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne are the four living creatures full of eyes before and behind and the four living creatures are a representation of God himself of the glory of God and God is everywhere he's omnipresent he is um, in the midst of the throne and he's round about the throne and he is uh, everywhere Uh, there is no place where God does not venture and also it says the four living creatures are full of eyes before and behind they they have many eyes and with eyes we see and it it just stands the reason the more eyes you have the more things you'll be able to see and since this is describing um, eternal God well what does it mean when it when it speaks of a figure a representation of eternal God and says that that um, that type and figure is full of eyes before and behind well it can only mean one thing that God sees all as we read in Proverbs chapter 15 it says in verse 3 the eyes of Jehovah are in every place beholding the evil and the good now talk about numerous eyes. Here the eyes of Jehovah are everywhere. They're in every nation, in every city, in every town, in every house. And uh, they behold everything that is good and evil. And of course that, that um, describes everything that takes place in this world. It's either a good act or it's an evil act. And God sees it all. There's nothing that his eyes miss. For instance, that's what uh, we we learn when we read the book of Hebrews in chapter 4. As we read of uh, the uh, uh, glorious nature of the word of God in verse, qu- in, <laughs> in verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And here God is making it known. And, of course, this is um, known to, to mankind uh, intuitively, instinctively. We know when we sin that God saw it, that God knows about it, that he um, is not happy with it, is very displeased about it. It's why men... Uh, uh, try their best to um, uh, to get away from the whole concept, the whole idea 
of God, that there is a God. They, they try to cover over their sins by um, developing ridiculous uh, teachings such as evolution, by claiming to be atheist, that is, someone who says no God, and, and uh, they, they get themselves to believe this. But deep down, the Bible tells us, everyone knows, everyone in their subconscious or uh, whatever part of them uh, the Bible uh, is referring to when it speaks of the law of God written on their heart, there is, an, uh, there is a knowledge of God. And, and this is why man is trying to um, erase God, to remove him from wherever he can remove him, to get away from this all-piercing gaze, this, this um, ability of God to see everything. Notice how the Word of God pierces and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Oh my, not only is God watching everything I do and, and taking note of every action, of, of every outward thing, not only does he uh, keep a full record and, and is aware of everything I say, the words that come out of my mouth, uh, okay, uh, so do other people, they, they see some of my actions and they hear some of my words. Maybe we could live with that. But, but this God is able to penetrate into my very being. And he sees the, uh, the deep thoughts of my heart. And he knows what is happening within me. And this is why Jesus said, if a man... Um, look upon a woman and and um, with with lust that he has already committed adultery and God carries the law to uh, a standard that is unattainable by mankind fallen man it, it is a perfect standard and you cannot reach that perfect standard just by not acting upon your sinful thoughts. You must reach that perfect standard by not having sinful thoughts. That's the only way anyone can keep the law of God perfectly is to somehow no longer have evil thoughts, no longer to have evil desires, and, and so on. And, and what uh, an absolutely pure and holy and perfect standard that is, that is the standard that the law of God demands. And if we fail in one point to keep that standard within or without, we are guilty of all and we are subject to the penalty of the wrath of God. It's no wonder then that man wants to escape this um, this constant um, gaze of God upon him uh, to get out from under this uh, this looking and observing uh, and watching of God of everything that that he does in his life. But of course, um, as as people develop these teachings like evolution and and they theorize that there is no God and and so forth. They, they they comfort their own minds, maybe, and now they can relax, and now they can um, uh, do their their own thing and sin as they please, but they haven't accomplished anything. They haven't gotten rid of God. He's still there, and he's still watching. And, and these are the eyes of God we see in our verse in Revelation chapter 4. They're they're full uh, the four living creatures are full of eyes before and behind okay let's uh, move on to verse 7 and the first living creature i'm just going to start substituting 
the um, the corrected translation for this. And the first living creature was like a lion, and the second living creature like a calf, and the third living creature had a face as a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. Here God is again referring to himself. All these things have application to himself. They are describing his glorious being. And God has chosen four creatures, living creatures, to typify himself. So let's look at each one of these. We'll we'll just take a quick look at each one. The first living creature is a lion. And now we, we don't have to go very far to find that God typifies himself as a lion. In the next chapter of Revelation, in Revelation 5, in, in verse 5, it says, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And this um, this statement, the lion of the tribe of Judah, or this name given to the Lord Jesus Christ, is drawn from the book of Genesis when Jacob had called his sons together and and he had um, spoken of Judah as a lion. And yet it was pointing spiritually to the Lord, to Jesus Christ. So we can see why the first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature is said to be like a calf. And a calf would be used in Old Testament sacrifices and and therefore it would be also a type of Christ as all of the sacrifices that God required of Israel were all pictures of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so we can uh, understand the calf um, would also typify him, but we... we find this same Greek word translated as calf in Luke 15 in the parable of the prodigal son it says in verse 23 this is after the son is returned and the father is making this statement and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found And they began to be merry. The spiritual picture here is that the prodigal returns, who is um, a a type of uh, one of God's elect, who's a sinner, and, and God has drawn him to himself from the world. And now he has applied the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ And it is as though Christ has died for him. That's why the calf, the fatted calf is killed. And and then the other son in that parable complains to his father at a later time. um, You never gave me a kid that I make, make merry with my friends, indicating that he was not a true believer, not someone that a Christ had died for. Well, The lion represents Christ. The calf represents Christ. And the third living creature had a face as a man. Now, of course, we can see this very clearly, very definitely, as the Lord Jesus entered into the human race and took upon him the form of a servant. He became man, a God-man, He never stopped being eternal God, but also man. And and that's why the living creature that uh, is uh, revealing the glory of God also has the face of a man. And the fourth living creature is said to be like a flying eagle. Now, this is the, the most difficult one to apply to God of the four. Uh, we we um, really 
have to search the Bible and see why would God be uh, using this description of an eagle, a flying eagle, uh, to describe himself. And when we do search the scriptures, we, we find information related to this in Deuteronomy chapter 32. In Deuteronomy 32, and I'll start reading in verse 9, it says there, For Jehovah's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the waste howling wilderness. He led him about. He instructed him. He kept him as the apple of his eye. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. So Jehovah alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. He made him ride on the high places of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields, and he might and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep, with fat of lambs and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats with the fat of kidneys of wheat, and thou didst drink the pure blood of the great. Now here we, we find God is referring to Jacob, who uh, is um, used to describe the elect. And, and he, he says that he found him, Jacob the elect, in a desert land, and he kept him as the apple of his eye, and as an eagle, that this would be, um, referring to God, as an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, beareth them on her wings. Like an eagle would put her young um, hatchlings or, or her, her young eagles on her wings and bear them, so... Deuteronomy 32, verse 12 says, So Jehovah alone did lead him, and there was no strange God with him. Speaking of Jacob, and and this is um, indicating that God will do with his people, the elect, what an eagle does with her young, that he will bear them up. And notice also that he made him it, it, uh, suck honey out of a rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine and milk of sheep. All this language is pointing to uh, God providing spiritual nourishment for uh, his people, that he will take care of them. And, and that would be similar to um, the mother eagle taking care of her young. Well, now that that image is found also in the book of Isaiah. The image of uh, being born upon eagles' wings. In Isaiah chapter 40, it says, and uh, I'll start reading in verse 28, because this passage is is really very um, touching. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon Jehovah shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Now, the the way um, this sounds in in our English is that these um, these weary young men, these weary youths, uh, will who wait upon the Lord will have renewed strength. And they shall mount up with wings as eagles. It's almost as though we can visualize them taking flight 
and uh, beginning to fly as an eagle in the sky with their own wings. But actually, uh, when we look at the Hebrew, this literally should read it, where it says, They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall go up wings like eagles. And when we tie this together with what we just read in Deuteronomy 32, we realize that these weary souls, and uh, this passage is uh, very appropriate for us today, because God's people certainly are weary, very spiritually weary. And, and yet God is our strength. He is our power. We don't have any power in ourselves to take flight. But he comes as an eagle. And we may mount up or go up upon his wings as eagles do, as the mother eagle and her young. And he will carry us forth. And he will protect us. And he will nourish us and take care of all of our spiritual needs. Well, that is... Uh, is actually the very picture that we find in the book of Revelation in chapter 12 when the woman, uh, or where the woman that, that gave birth to the man-child, remember the, the four living creatures, one of them had the face of a man, and that man-child was Christ. And in this passage, Satan um is um he he is disappointed that he cannot destroy the child so he goes after the woman that brought forth the man child and we read in verse 13 of revelation 12 and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And here God is assuring us and comforting us and encouraging us that even when things may look bleak and when they are difficult and, and when a weariness has set in, that uh, he will be there to help us. And he is this eagle that we can uh, uh, mount up upon and go forth, and he will protect us from persecution as well as nourish us as uh, a mother eagle would her young.